Hello. Good morning, everybody. Wow, that was, everyone just came right down. That was great. Uh, good morning. Welcome here this morning. Um, yeah, I lost everything that I was going to say. Cool. Um, good morning. Thanks, Dave. Um, I guess this morning, I just, I'll just start with uh, our passage this morning. It's Isaiah 40. Verse 28 to 31. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not go weary. They will walk and never faint. Um, yeah, so uh, this end of the week, I guess this weekend, my, my wife's been gone with all the kids to Edmonton, so party for me. I thought I was, I've been home alone for the last little while. And I used to think that that was, like, great and fun. But it's, uh, it's really interesting. Um, and actually, I texted Joe on, like, I don't know, Wednesday to send me the passage for this week, and in typical Joe fashion, I think he texted me Friday night. But, <laughs> but that was actually good, because um, it's funny how God kind of sends you stuff that you need to hear when you need to hear it, and this verse was kind of perfect for that, when it says, um, uh, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength, and they will soar like eagles, knock or weary, and never faint. Having Not having my wife, like I said here, I thought it would be good, but I mean, it really, it, it's a time when the, the devil can really attack your, your struggles and your fears. And uh, yeah, it's, it's funny how, you know, your person, your wife is perfect for you. Like they, when somebody's there to help you, a, a physical person, they're there to lean on and talk about things and things go smoothly. But when that person's not there, uh, yeah, the devil can pick at those little things and attack you, right? So having, just Joe sent that verse and just, yeah, just trust the Lord and to have someone to lean on, um, and that being God instead of somebody physical was great for me this weekend. Anyways, um, announcements this morning. Um, uh, Saturday, oh no, that happened already. So, Sunday today, Sunday, newcomer's lunch. After the service, so if you're new to the church, there's lunch after. Please come join us for that with the pastors and the elders and just learn about the church and how we can, what we can do for you and how you can kind of fit into what we do here. So please come to that. Um, tomorrow evening at 7, there's a baby shower for Christina Miller and Nehemiah and Sarika, and I'm not going to even attempt your last name. And baby Elrika. So that's tomorrow evening at 7 for, for them. Um, there are a lot of dishes that people have not claimed. And lots of lost and found. So please, if you think you're missing something, um, go try to find it. Because eventually it will all go to the Salvation Army. And if you want it to go to the Salvation Army, great. Uh, they like donations. So uh, That's it for announcements. Um, our prayer corner this morning. Our families of the week this week are Femi Murphy and Darren and Corey and Levi and Sadie. Our church uh, of Melford is Lady of Consolation Catholic, Father George Canto, and our AGC church, Westland Community Church in McGregor. That's Pastor Myron Friesen. Also, um, our local partners this week, Darren and Joan Evans, they're doing the Bible studies by mail in New Mexico. And I'm just going to read, I don't know, it came in the church email. I'll just kind of read what they sent here um, from a couple of their uh, people they're sending studies to. Um, Many thanks for your time spent to send me the Bible studies. I love reading them a lot because I'm learning the Word of God and it is helping me a lot. Two of my cellmates want to receive these Bible studies. It is such a blessing for us in prison to have people like you. Uh, many blessings. That was Myrna. Um, and she would like prayer... Um, that they would receive these lessons and that there wouldn't be any difficulties receiving them through the prison mailroom. And then Cassie, 
um, says the most important thing she has learned is that money doesn't make us happy. God wants us to have something, it will be his will, and we will have it. I mainly learned that I should be happy with the things I do have and be thankful to God for what he has given me. And one more. My prayers have been answered. My lawyer called me and we talked for about 30 minutes. Our time ended with him praying for me. I told him about your Bible studies that I was doing and how you would be sending me a letter of recommendation. He was ecstatic to hear that and asked it to be sent to him in Texas. Thank you all so much in Christ. Uh, that's it. And then also uh, we'll remember to pray for uh, the grief share that's been ongoing here. Let's just pray this morning together. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. Thank you that the, the sun is shining and the snow is melting, God. Um, I just want to lift up uh, Femi this morning. Um, just uh, She hasn't been able to attend in the last little while, and I just pray that you are, you are with her and that uh, you keep her in, in good health and good spirits and that... Um, Maybe one day we, we could, she could join with us here again. Um, just also want to pray for Darren and Corey and Levi and Sadie. I just pray that, uh, yeah, you're, you're with them as they continue to, um, just in everyday life and with, with health, that your, your hands are just in, in their lives and in every situation. I want to pray for Darren, Daryl and Joan. Um, um, just pray that um, you are working in, in their Bible studies by mail. Um, for Myrna and Santa and Maribel, Maribel that um, there would just be no issues, that they would receive, um, receive those studies and that there would be no interference through the, the prison or through the mail system. And for Cassie to be able to invite her friends to the Bible studies. And for Jonathan as well, just keep his mindset focused on Christ daily and that he can, can trust in him. I just too want to pray for Father George Canto and Myron Friesen this morning and Pastor Joe as well as he preaches this morning and as they lead their services, that you just uh, uh, give them the words to say this morning and the words that we need to hear and that they, they lean on you in this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'll invite you to stand with us if you would like. If you would prefer to remain seated, by all means, uh, feel free to do so. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. I come broken hearted, let a rescue begin. I come find your mercy, oh sinner, come heal. Our earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Our earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burden. There's rest for the weary, a rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can endure. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are up your face. Falling in 
I just appreciate that song. I, uh, I think it's probably something we can all uh, relate to, right? We're all, we're all broken. We all still are, uh, struggle with sin, and uh, you know, but, but we have that hope, and that's what we want to sing about uh, this morning, that hope. We've come through the Easter, Easter season, and uh, we just continue to wait in anticipation for, for the Lord's return. I'm just going to read uh, from Psalm 8. <clears throat> I can do this without dropping my Bible. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> <clears throat> Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Because of your, because of your enemies... To silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. All that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. <clears throat> yeah, so as we continue to sing, just want to uh, keep that in mind, right? We serve a risen, a risen Savior. Here I am to worship, here I am to worship. 
Sorrow and dead in my sin. I lost without hope, with no place to begin. And your love made a way to let mercy come in. I went death was arrested, and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty. My open heart was given a My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. I went death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free, wash his I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. He faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested in my life, he is over me. You have made me new now life begins with you. It's your end. See 
Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. And darkness rejoices though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with our freedom in day. When death was arrested in my Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins. Jesus, we just thank you so much for, for redeeming us, Lord. There's nothing we could do in our own power. That's all because of what you've done. We thank you, Lord. Oh, 
great and mighty one, with one desire we come, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We're offering up our lives, a living sacrifice, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. And so reign, please reign in us, come purify our hearts, and we need your touch, come cleanse us like a flood, and send us up, so the world may Please reign in us, come purify our hearts, we need your touch, come cleanse us like a flood, and send us out, so the world may know you reign, you reign in us. Oh, great and mighty one. With one desire we come, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. We're offering up our lives, a living sacrifice, that you would reign, that you would reign in us. So I've been told that the timing of this song is probably not what you're used to. So if I mess up this hymn, you can blame me after. But. And God sent his son. They called him Jesus. And he came to To buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he child can face uncertain days because he
We just thank you so much for the hope that we have, uh, Lord, as we were uh, learning in Sunday school. And just, um, again, no matter what happens in this world, <clears throat> no matter what happens to our bodies, God, we have hope and assurance in you. And we thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Rob and team. Uh, good morning again. My name's Phil Houston. I'm uh, one of the pastors here, and today I'm just the announcement guy. So we have a couple of announcements that are a little bit, uh, or not announcements, but events maybe that are a little bit uh, uh, out of scope for normal. We're going to have some missionaries come and speak to us, and we're also going to announce a, a baby bottle campaign, I think it's called. So, Evie, if you can show that video that says uh, it should be N-E-O-P. There it is. Here it is. Strictly, I'm the director of Northeast Pregnancy Options, a pregnancy care center opening soon in Melfort. We want to invite you to be a part of our first annual baby bottle campaign. This is a super simple fundraiser anyone can do. You just need to pick up a baby bottle, share about the work our pregnancy center is doing, fill it with donations, and bring the bottle back where you picked it up. We've been working on establishing this much needed center for just over a year. We're affiliated with Pregnancy Care Canada and working closely with them to prep for our organization and train to serve our clients. The funds raised will go towards providing free and confidential support for individuals facing unexpected pregnancy and those that have experienced pregnancy related loss. This includes free pregnancy tests, prenatal and parenting support, post abortive support and options information. It also includes material items from our care closet like maternity clothes and kids clothing up to two years old. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on the support of our Northeast communities and churches. We want to thank you so much for your encouragement. We felt your prayers and know God's hand is on this center. We look forward to partnering with you for this fundraiser. If you have any questions, please reach out to your pastor or the representative from your congregation. Hello, I'm Tanya Moulton and I'm the representative from your church. Um, so I'm just going to put the poster in the back and the baby bottles will be available May the 8th, which is Mother's Day. Pretty fitting. Um, we are um, strong believers that every life is precious and we are all made in the image of God. So if you have any questions, come and see me or if you want to volunteer, I'll help you out with that too. Thank you.
Thanks, Tanya. Uh, Brennan reminded me that he forgot to uh, tell you all that we have a uh, Body Life event here this upcoming weekend on Friday. We're going to have a games night uh, that's featuring a family feud uh, style game. Larry and I, Larry Spratt and I are going to be working on that this week. And then we'll have all kinds of board games and food and snacks. So we do want to welcome all of you out. There'll be games for, uh, for little guys and for medium sized people and for bigger sized people. I don't know where I'm going. This is supposed to be ages, not sizes. <laughs> this is why people write things down when they make announcements. Um, and I'm sure Jesse and Bobby have lots written down, so you guys can come on up. Uh, you may have uh, seen or met uh, Jesse and uh, Bobby Foster uh, as they've been with our church uh, for about the last six or eight months. They are missionaries, and uh, they are going to tell us a little bit about uh, their work that they're preparing to go and do. And uh, so I'll turn it over to them for the next couple of minutes. Hi, yeah, I'm Jesse, and this is Bobby. I grew up in Canistano, just down the road, and uh, through different connections, you probably know, you may know me, you may know my parents, Ron and Eunice, you may know some of my siblings, because I'm from a fairly big family. Anyway, we just moved back to this area last June, and so... Um, the Lord uh, led us to this church, and we've just been really blessed being able to be here, get to know many of you. And yeah, we've been traveling a lot with, our, with speaking and, and with our work, but we're just really pleased to be part of this body here. And, so, and we're really pleased to be able to share with you briefly this morning about uh, kind of who we are and, and what the Lord has led us into. Okay, so I'll just give a bit more of an introduction and a bit of background on us. Um, so we actually moved up north to be uh, neighbors with his parents, but also to have a headquarters because we've been on the move for eight years um, in ministry positions in different places. And so I'm going to just ask for that first video to go up called Hi from the Fosters. It gives us a quick one minute and a half overview of our ministry work. My name is Bobby. This is my husband, Jesse. We have been married for, well, going on 10 years now. We've got two adorable children, and we want to invite you into the journey that we've been on, following God's call to work amongst different nations. And he's been growing in us a love for the nations, um, people that really are desperate for hope. And so we want to invite you in on this journey. We've been in Rwanda uh, for a shorter stint and then in that time of doing discipleship work and sustainability projects and community development, all gospel-centered, we really had this sense of, well, what if people have never heard? And so that led us to missions training. Uh, we trained with an organization called WEC in Ontario. And from there, the Lord guided us to go to China. And uh, our time there was incredible. So very similar commonalities of, of being in Rwanda. There was the militarization. Um, but in the area we were in, it was uh, a lot of surveillance and other, other complexities. But in all of it, God was faithful. And amidst all of that, I mean, hopelessness was rampant. But we have the answer. So when we follow God, we know there's no knowing what will happen, um, what glory will come. And we recently in the last year have said yes to following the Lord in working with the Garrets. Uh, they work in Myanmar and on the border of Thailand as well and we're going to be working in this little red house. So we want to invite you because we are all God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do together. Would you join us? So hopefully that gave you a bit more of a glimpse into our world. I know a picture is worth a thousand words. So um, we've been kind of all over and moved too many times. So it was time to kind of settle down, put down some roots and community roots. And uh, we're really hoping to call uh, Park Ave our home church um, for whenever we're home on furlough going forward. Um, we're aiming to move to uh, the border of Myanmar in the next like month and a half. Um, so it's coming up quick on us here. A lot of things are shifting, and so um, we're not there until we're really there. <laughs> we don't count anything given until we're actually landed. And I'm going to give it back to Jess just to share a bit more about what we'll be doing there. Sure. So in, uh, you may be aware that in, 2000, in 2021, January, there was a coup in Myanmar where um, the government was taken by the military, and uh, there's 
every, you can find it all over the news if you look for it, and I don't have time to go into it here, but there's um, over 800,000 displaced people. Big organizations like the UN, UNICEF, some of these more well-known relief organizations that, that you might know of are not able to operate, they're not able to run refugee camps, they're not able to run anything really because of the political dynamics between that in that region and uh, it's small organizations like nation to nation our organization that actually can operate can partner with local churches local ministries local people and we can actually operate to distribute uh, aid relief um, there's a house there we're calling it the red house community or life hub community center and um, it is it is a place for the Lord to use in whatever way, whether it be like a family center or a place where people are come, where they come and they're trained. Uh, right now, currently, our teammates are there and our, our leaders, Kevin and Julia, are there. And they are making, they're making relief with local people in terms of like chili paste, soap, um, shampoo, uh, gathering medicines, buying local food and then partnering with local partners to take it into the jungles to people that are running and are fleeing. Their, their villages have been destroyed, their livelihoods have been destroyed, and uh, they're desperate for hope. And so our people are going in with the message of the gospel in a very practical, tangible way of bringing them hope for another, another week, another two weeks in terms of sustaining their body and meeting their medical needs. And I'll just say a little bit of a note about how we got integrated into Nation to Nation. Um, our story with our directors from Nation to Nation goes back to when we were in China. Well, before we were in China, we were preparing to go, and we had heard that some missionaries had been, oh, hang on, Arthur, not yet, honey, not your turn. I'll call you in one minute. One minute, honey, thank you. Um, um, you could call them up and get their backpacks and stuff. Okay, boys, you can come up and get ready. Um, so we were getting ready to go to China, and these missionaries in China were um, arrested and put in prison, and it just felt a little bit too close to home. So we were praying for Kevin and Julia Garrett through their two years in imprisonment, and I remember where I was standing in my apartment in China when I read the news that they had been released, and just a wave of relief and of praising the Lord came over us. And um, then we were back in, Ch in Saskatoon going to the Chinese church, and Kevin and Julia came and spoke and shared their testimony of what God did for them in Chinese prison. And that really impacted us. And we started getting their newsletters of what they were doing, um, their email newsletters. They never wrote about where they were working, so they came back from China, and then they started um, their own organization called Nation to Nation um, and started working in Myanmar. We didn't know that, though. And so when we were getting ready to go back overseas a year ago, um, we were praying, Lord, open the doors, open the doors for us. And Jesse was just on the tail end of his uh, international relations degree. We're saying, Lord, we're almost there. We're almost done. We're ready to go back. And then I was reading one of the Garrett's updates, and I thought, oh, I just want to work for these guys. Every time I read their updates, I just want to work for them. They're just, they're doing the things. They're preaching Christ, and they're um, helping the poor and the people in crisis. And so I emailed them, like, hey, big fan over here. Can we work for you? You don't remember us. Sorry about my voice. I have like a cold. <clears throat> Anyways, it's not COVID. Don't worry. Um, <clears throat> I know everyone's feeling nervous like, uh, uh. Um, Anyways, I'm just going to just finish up here before the boys share. And what was so exciting was they were looking for workers. Kevin and Julia were like, yes, we would love to interview you guys and start the process of training you guys. We're like, and where do you work? They're like, oh, in Myanmar. We're like, okay, sweet. Sign us up. Like, we just want to work for you. Like, we're, we just are gung-ho to go wherever the Lord has work. So I'm just going to ask the boys a quick question. Johan, would you tell me, what would you like to tell me about going to Myanmar, to the border of Myanmar? Well, um, I think it's going to be good there, and um, we're going to be missionaries in Thailand. And why, why do we need to go there? So, people running from it. People are running from the military. Yeah, so there's a time of in intense need right now. And just this last week, 800 people crossed over. Um, and our team is directly delivering aid to them right now. 
Um, so very vulnerable crisis. Could you share that second video? Thank you. on the border of Thailand and Myanmar. You may remember a bit of our story. We spent 30 or so years in China. Then we spent two more years in prison in China. We wrote a book about that. Then in 2018, God called us to work in the country of Myanmar, formerly Burma. We thought that it was gonna be much easier than it is because last year there was a military coup and everything changed. It's now a creative access nation. Here in the, what we call the Red House, our life hub, we have, uh, we're training Burmese youth, giving them practical skills in, in business so they can later give themselves a hope in the future and to be, take the gospel into places that many of us cannot go. We're making things like soap and shampoo, we make chili paste, um, mosquito spray, energy bars. These are the practical things that we're making that go into Myanmar, into the tens of thousands who have, are fleeing the military oppression there and the military coup. So we're helping them, the youth practically learn skills. We're giving those in need practical items that, that they can't get when they're on the run and hiding in the jungles or in ITP camps. We're also doing things like supplying water systems. We're giving practical food aid, truckloads of food or noodles or fish. And we're also able to work in the villages in this area, in the surrounding area here. A couple weekends ago, we were in a village a couple hours north and up a mountain road. And uh, we didn't know there was a church in that village. And when we got there, an old lady who had leprosy came up to us and said, would you pray for me? And we said, sure. And we, were, we prayed for her and she started getting feeling back into her fingers when she didn't have it before in those gnarled hands. We see God at work in so many practical and amazing ways in this place. And we just want to thank you for your part in what you're doing for World Missions, your support and your prayers for us here in the border community between Thailand and Myanmar and what God is doing. It really is amazing. Thank you. Uh, Jesse's just going to briefly share a song that he wrote out of a space of um, praying for and and preparing for um, our work in Myanmar, uh, just the heart of missions. Yeah. You say to all those running and afraid, I am near to you, and I am your peace. You say. To all who are weary, come and find everlasting rest, for I am God. So I bring them to you now, that they'd find the light to light their way. And let us work with you as you bring them home. Let our reason for living be to glorify you, to let ourselves be nothing, to let Jesus shine through. Let all those in darkness might see and understand and be rescued by your love. And carry it in your hands. You search for hearts fully devoted to you. And you call them out. And give them strength. You search for hearts, Father fully devoted to you and you call them out and give them strength so I bring them to you now that they would be strong in this hour 
our family's prayer. Maybe this is yours too. Ready. We are ready. Send us out into your fields all ripe and gold. Ready. Oh, we are ready. Through your power, we're made meek, but we're made bold. Give us your eyes, and give us your mind. We're with you, Lord, and it's the right. Let Jesus shine through. That all those in darkness might see and understand and be rescued by your love and carried in your hands and rescued by your love and carried And that is our family's prayer. And that's what we want the Lord to send us out to do. So thanks for letting us share. Good morning. My name is Karina, and I'm the prayer coordinator here today. And the theme that Pastor Joe gave for us for this Sunday was that we would find strength in God and not in the things of man. And so I, I'm going to use the word Godfidence, where we just have total assurance and trust in God's power and strength. Now, I had a story, but I really feel that the Foster family emanated Godfidence this morning. You can see they're traveling the world sharing uh, Jesus, totally relying on God's uh, strength. And so that's the kind of Godfidence that I want us to pray into our own hearts, into our families, uh, and into our lives uh, today. And you'll see I, I left you with a little bit of a prayer sheet that you'll find around you where we really talked about how uh, David strengthened himself in the Lord and that we can do that too. Not always just to pray for God to protect us, but to strengthen us as we go through times of trials and testing. And so before we pray here at Park Avenue, we always read God's word aloud together. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you'll find the blue uh, section on your sheet and we'll read it aloud together. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. To be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Okay, so you'll see today I've left you with a prayer acronym, Fellowship. I really believe our highest call is to deepen our personal relationship and have intimate 
fellowship with God and, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And so I've left it with you, and you can use it uh, throughout the weeks and months ahead. And kids, you'll see that there's some pictures there. So lead your parents in improving and, and enjoying their time talking with God as well. And I'll come up and close us off soon. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord, that Park Avenue will be a people, be a church, Lord, that are confident. Lord, help us to know that with you we can do everything. Lord, help us to pray for your strength daily. Lord, thank you for the children and the teenagers and the adults and the seniors in our church. Lord, may we rise up as warriors, Lord. Lord, I pray today, Lord, that we will go out in the world, Lord, and be on mission, just like the Foster family, Lord, sharing your uh, gospel truth with all those that need hope. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, kids, come on up.
cockroaches would be very bad. <laughs> Grab a chocolate after you've got your lid at the end of the circle. Oh. Um, I like these. I like to. Uh, I just want the laser for you. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. You go to Sunday school. <laughs> oh, look at that. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's good to be here. Why don't we pray, and then uh, we'll start our sermon. Lord, I thank you that you are so good to us, and... Uh, Look for the encouragement that we can get from hearing of the work that you're doing in and through other people. Um, Lord, I pray that as we dig into your word a little bit, that you would help us to understand you more and to um, grow to love you more. Uh, I pray that you'd help me to speak clearly, um, and Lord, that you would be glorified. Amen. So, um, after my third year of Bible school... I started a new job with a company doing stucco and drywall. I had done stucco for two years before this, but I'd never done drywall before. And usually, it takes me a while to figure things out, but once I get them, then I'm good. But it's usually a little stressful. I'm like, it's not just drywall. They're like boarding and all the different tasks. So it took me a little while to feel like I could keep up with everyone with all the different little tasks. And so I got married during that summer. And it was probably about a month or two after we got married. Um, I must have had a stressful day at work the day before, and I at, was at home working, doing some drywall, and uh, there's drywall dust all over, and there's pieces of drywall that fell, fell on the bed, and uh, they almost woke Shelby up, so I decided to be a good husband, like move and clean up, and I didn't want to be crumbs all over. And so I'm walking around, the bed, and she like gets up, like, "What are you doing?" Like, obviously, I'm cleaning up the drywall, and so she like looks at me real weird and lays back down. So then I go and I'm like feeling, "Where in the world did this piece fall?" And I can't find it, and I'm like patting her, she looks up, like, "What are you doing?" And then suddenly I realize that maybe I had been dreaming about all this drywall stuff. <laughs> and I'm just a creepy guy just patting the bed in the middle of the night. But obviously I'm not going to admit that. So I just like, nothing. And then I, <laughs> and then whatever, I'm going to bed. And then I walk back to the other side. And uh, yeah, she still bugs me with that to this day for some reason. Um, but... Sometimes it just takes someone to say something or a circumstance to arise to kind of snap you out of a daze or a funk and to bring you back to reality or to bring you back to what you should be doing rather than what you have been doing. Um, so two weeks ago, we looked at David when he went with the Philistines uh, to, like they were about to engage in war with Israel. And so they were uh, like, they were the bodyguards, they're following and um, David was not allowed to stay with the army, despite his best efforts and his best lies. Um, the other generals of the Philistine army were like, no, this is a huge conflict of interest. David's got to go. And so the king reluctantly agreed and let him go, or told him to go, uh, despite what he wanted to do. So uh, David had been living with the Philistines for about a year and four months. And we only get uh, like a few different snapshots of what life um, was like for David at this point. Um, 
But really, we, from the, the glimpses that we do get of David, there is not any time in this period of when he's with the Philistines that we actually see him seeking the Lord. Um, about a month ago, when I was preaching last, we saw David decided to run to go to the Philistines because he didn't really trust that God would continue to protect him. He just thought, like, I'm not going to be safe forever, so I'm going to run to the Philistines. And then in the Philistines, he lies to the king about where they're going, where they're actually raiding, and tells them the opposite of what they're actually doing. And then with this episode with the army, the, I was looking at my Bible last week as Phil was preaching, and it says that the king was like, David, I know you've always been honest with me, which is not true. <laughs> and so like, it would have been like a pretty, but like, he kind of like, doubles down, like, no, I have been. Like, what are you doing? And so we kind of like, get this glimpse of like, David starting to do things that, the way that he thinks they should be, trying to get control, trying to, yeah, not, not necessarily trust the Lord, and not, not super evil, but just slow steps of, I'm going to control my circumstances. I'm going to try to save myself, to do what I believe is best. And, and so, like, it, it kind of seems, we can kind of get the idea that maybe David will meet the same fate as Saul, right? A great man who started well, but just slowly started to drift away from what the Lord had called him to. So if you have your Bibles, you can uh, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. That's where we'll be reading today. And uh, let's just start with verse 1. And uh, I'll be reading out of the ESV, in case you're confused. Um, It says, Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one. Ooh, I read too much. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. It's the end of verse 1. Um, so David is up in more northern Philistia or Israel, and they, it's about a 170, 180 kilometer journey back to Ziklag, and they do it in about three days, which is pretty impressive. That means they're clipping 60k a day on the way back. So they were given her. Um, now, it is a little bit weird that they're covering such a huge amount of distance when there's like, it doesn't, you wouldn't think that there would be anything urgent that would require them to run that quickly. But if you think about it, all of the army of Philistia is up north, including David and his men, which leaves the bottom section of the country completely vulnerable. There's absolutely nobody protecting them. And like for the, the rest of their families, they basically have an entire family of women and children on their own. Like if any army comes, they're not putting up a fight. That's, that's the end. So you, it doesn't say it, but we can imagine that they were probably like, okay, we better get back to like make sure that we can protect our family to take care of them. At least that's my suspicion as to why they made such quick time on the way back. Um, and so they get close, and they probably saw some smoke, or that's my guess, from far off, and their hearts probably sunk, and like, ooh, no. Like, maybe we're too late. And so we see in this verse that it was the Amalekites who had come and raided and burned the, this town. Now, if you have an amazing memory, you'll remember that Saul, um, when he had attacked, so there was the king Ag- Agag, and uh, he didn't kill everyone he was supposed to. He had brought him, and, and uh, that's when Samuel said, what's the bleeding of sheep that I hear in my ears? Um, those were the Amalekites that they were supposed to have wiped out. And clearly, not the case, because here they are again. And so he may have killed uh, a, a town of them or a section, but there were still many more that were around. And, and these people have kind of like popped up all throughout Israel's history as kind of these... And, and, enemies, like they were the first people who attacked Israel when they left the promised land, Um, even though the fact that they're kind of a sister nation, they're descendants of Esau. So the Amalekites, verse 2 says, um, 
and taken captive the woman and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. So everybody's taken alive, and there could have been a few reasons why they, why they took everybody alive. Um, the first, they could have been wanting them to sell as slaves. They could have been wanting them to have as slaves. They could have wanted them for blackmail or ransom or all of the above. Like they're, they're not good intentions likely um, with all these uh, prisoners that they had taken in. And just because they were taken in live also doesn't mean that they weren't harmed. They, they very likely were uh, abused many different kinds of ways. So they're taken all the way. Verse 3 to 6. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David, David's two wives also had been taken captive, uh, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed. We'll read the rest of verse 6 later. David and his men, they come to the city, and what their suspicions were from a distance is confirmed true. The city is burned down to the ground. And they wouldn't have known that their family members weren't all killed, but they probably would have had some suspicions that because there's no bodies anywhere, but still there's not a lot of hope that we're ever going to see them again, ever be able to rescue them. So they're crushed. Um, and like, put yourself in the shoes of these men. Right? They had decided to follow David, and 1 Samuel 22 talks about how most of these men were either running from deaths that they had, running from trouble that they had, or were just people who were upset with life. So not super awesome guys that we would generally associate with, more like hardened, not almost criminals, kind of criminals. Um, and so... Like, what's life been with David been like? They lived on the run for a while, walking through the desert, didn't really have any home, um, don't really have a lot of food, they're hungry most of the time, and they're not allowed to kill the guy who's making all of these issues happen for them. And then they, find, they get to escape to Philistia, and they get to finally settle in Ziklag. And they finally have a purpose. Like they're going raiding, being, saving the towns around them. And so you kind of like these guys wandering, not a lot of purpose, a lot of suffering. And they finally, you know, like just like picture like a breath of fresh air, like, oh, like this is actually why we're here. This is what we have to do. They have a home. They go, they follow David, come back, and all of it's gone. They, all of the stuff that they had built up. Finally, the breath of fresh air that they had is, is gone. And so, um, like, they, they weep because their children are gone, their wives are gone, their house is gone, their possessions are gone. They have nothing. The battle-hardened criminal men are broken, and they weep until they have no voice left. Verse 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. I'll stop there. So in their anguish, the men, I guess they maybe take stock of what had happened, or what life's been like with David. They've been wandered in the desert, they've been hungry, they've lost the only home they've known, they lost their children, they lost their wives. Plus, they're not necessarily thinking rationally, because they're going through some intense grief. And so they start tossing around the idea of like, hey, maybe we should kill David. Maybe we should throw rocks at him until he dies. Because look at what he's gotten us this far. And also, imagine being David. You get back from being with the army that you dragged uh, all these men to, and it's because of your decision to suck up to the king, to be in Philistia, that this is happening. Um, you, everyone is blaming you, and you can kind of see the reason of, like, everyone saying, this is my fault, and maybe they're right. It would have been really easy to start thinking, like, maybe I'm a bad leader. 
Maybe I'm in the wrong. Maybe I'm the reason why all of these families are done. Plus, the fear of, like, actually, maybe I'm going to die because they're going to kill me. But guilt, shame, self-doubt, fear would have all been swirling around in David's mind. And, like, anyone who's ever made decisions that affect other people know that when you make a bad decision and it hurts the people under you, it's brutal. Like, it's not a good feeling when you know that I caused these people pain. Like, whether you're, it's a parenting decision, you supervise others and you're at your job, or even for kids, like group projects at school or playing sports, like, when you're the one who messed up and hurt the people around you, that's not a fun place to be in. Now, I believe that this is all happening to steer, back, steer David kind of back on course to where he's kind of been. And we see these, these same kind of things pop up all the time in Saul's life, where it's like red flags of like, hey, Saul, you're, following, you're wandering away from God. And Saul just poof, runs past all these warning signs in his life. And so we kind of have another instance. Okay, is David going to do the same? Is he going to be bitter towards God? Is he going to try and protect himself from his men? Is he going to just maybe roll over and accept his fate? Or is he going to try and rule like with an iron fist like, like uh, Saul did? Like, what's David going to do when he's faced this test? Is he going to be like Saul or is he going to be different? Then the rest of verse 6. Um, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I think these are the most important words in the passage, in all the passages that we're going to look at today. David strengthened himself in the Lord. We're not told exactly how he did this or what he did, but he took his focus away from the intense pain, the painful problems, um, and rather than looking and being overwhelmed by that, he turned and looked to the Lord. He may have, maybe he sung some of the psalms that he had written in other times of distress. Um, maybe he remembered all the things that God had done for Israel, like all throughout the years, and, and had done for himself, like slaying Goliath and, and how he had been there for him before. Um, and David, unlike Saul, finds his strength in the Lord rather than himself. Like, Saul's life is constantly of him half following the Lord, but just really doing what I want to do and using the Lord to do what I think is best. And David says, okay, like I, I realize I can't do this. I'm going to turn to the Lord, trust in what he says, because I, I can't. He looks to God and finds the strength in him rather than himself. And I know that for, my, for myself, that's, that's difficult to do. Like when I'm overwhelmed or when I feel like I failed as a leader or when I know I haven't been seeking the Lord as I should, when bad things happen, I may whine or complain or want to blame God. But to turn my heart to the Lord and to trust him when I'm overwhelmed and I don't feel like I can, that's difficult, but it is important. It is what we are called to do and what is by far what's best for us. Um, we are often too quick to be like Saul and try to control the situations that we face or to, like Saul, try to spiritually control the outcome um, with God. Um, like we often say, or there's a lot of, in, in songs, we often say that the Lord is our strength, but is he really? Or are we just doing what we're doing? We're just trying to dig ourselves out of the hole the best we can and getting frustrated with God in the process. Where do you find your strength? Yourself or the Lord? Verse 7. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. Now, when I first read this verse, I was a little, I was quite confused because it seems like David's doing exactly what Saul was condemned for, of like doing a job only a priest was supposed to do. But, because um, like in my mind, you read this, and you're like, okay, David just said, okay, bring me this, put it on, and I'll do the, the thing that you're supposed to do with this, the ephod. But um, likely what happened is he told Abiathar to bring the ephod, and he came, the priest came wearing it, 
and he asked the questions, and the priest performed it. That way, he's not sinning, and he's not doing something that he's not supposed to. But his heart is, let's ask the Lord, let's turn to him, and let's see what he wants us to do. Let's obey him rather than just do what we think is best. Verse 8. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So God answers saying, Yeah, go ahead, chase after them, you'll catch them. And even better, he like reassures them of like, you're also going to get back everything that, you, that you've lost. Um, and I've been memorizing uh, Hebrews 12 with a, a few guys from the church, and it talks about how God disciplines the ones that he loves. And it seems like that's exactly what God's doing here, here with, uh, with David. He's, God's not cruel in letting this happen. He's steering David back on course and also being gracious to him in that everyone, everything that he's lost will be brought back to him. It's just a test of, are you going to turn back to me, David, or not? Because David, like, God loves David and wants the best for him. And so this is why this is happening. And thankfully, David listens. And we'll read verses 9 and 10. So David set out, and 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besser, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400. 200 stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besser. So I have a map that will pop up right away. And we mentioned at the start um, kind of the distances that they would have had to travel on their first day. And so, here in the first slide. Whoa, I have this thing. So, this is, I don't know how well you can see this, but this is Israel, this whole thing here. And this is kind of to the north, is where uh, they would have been camped, the, the armies would have been meeting each other. Next one. And so that's the distance that they would have had to travel. So this is where they're camped, and this is Ziklag at the bottom there. And so it is, Google says it will take you 37 hours to walk. So, and that's done in three days. And they also had, like, equipment and supplies. So they, they would have had to been traveling quickly, and it would have been exhausting. They would have gotten here and exhausted. So... Quite a ways between the two. Um, then, yeah, Pell the Mel, we're going home. Next slide. Next slide. So, they get to Ziklag that day, and maybe they would have probably gotten there late at night because it's 60 kilometers. You're not going to get there early in the morning. So, they get there, maybe they, they spend the night um, exhausted, crying, and then, like, I'm, I'm going to assume it was the next morning that. David turned to the Lord, and they asked him what to do. And then, so he said, okay, we're going to go. So they would have still been quite exhausted from the harrowing trip that they had just gone on. And so then this is another uh, 32 kilometers from Ziklag to the brook Besser. So it doesn't seem like as long, but it's still 32 kilometers, still quite a ways in a day. And the next slide, you'll see, so up north of here is all like, land and good things because there's some green and nothing south of here there's nothing it's just desert and desolate and so the people like the 600 men they start going and they're already exhausted from the trip that they just had and they get to there and like they've been raiding in this area so they know past here is just straight desert Ooh. and now We'd think that, like, yeah, but it's their kids and their family, so obviously they're going to be like, no, we're going to muster up enough strength to go and save them. But apparently they were absolutely exhausted, and they were like, we, we can't. We're done. So we're going to stop here, and 200, a third of the people are like, you guys go ahead, we'll stay here. And they, like, watch some extra luggage or something, and the rest of the 400 keep going. Like, oof. That's brutal. I mean, I get that they're tired, but it's your family. But that's what happened. Um, verse uh, 11 and 12. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate. 
they gave him water to drink. And they gave him a piece of cake, figs, and two clusters of raisins. And he had, and when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. So they're traveling in the wilderness, and they stumble across this guy. And I'm guessing he must have been like hiding under a rock or something because you're not going to survive three days just baking out in the sun in the desert. So they stumble across him, and like, he's an Egyptian, which they would have found out later. But they give him water and they give him food. And I did a bit of reading, and apparently this would have been more food than most of the soldiers got during this time, which it doesn't seem like much. He gives them like a fig cake and some raisins, which was like, that's maybe a, a small snack. But apparently that's more than the soldiers would have gotten. So they may have been like, really? We're going to give him that much food? And also, we're going to waste this amount of time because they haven't made sure that this guy's actually going to help them. It's just a random guy that they found, and he may have just been like, yeah, I wandered under the desert and then got lost. I'm like, oh, shoot. Well, I guess we got to go catch these guys. But David chooses to be gracious. He says, you know what? It doesn't matter if this guy is going to help us or not. We're going to stop and potentially waste valuable time caring for him, bringing him back to health. And if he helps us, great. If not, we'll keep chasing after them. And so you just kind of see David's heart and care for the, for the vulnerable, which is pretty cool to see at a time where they would have been desperate to, to get to what they were, where they were going. It kind of reminds me of the, the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus tells. Um, yeah, so we'll read verse 13 to 15. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because I felt sick three days ago. We had made a raid against uh, the Negeb, the Carathites, and against that which belongs to Judah, and against the Negeb of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, uh, will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. So, thankfully, the stranger says, Yeah, I was actually with those guys. Um, and he says, Well, can you take us to them? And he said, Yeah, absolutely I can. Just make sure you don't hand me over. Says, sure. Okay, and then they go. And there would have been some amount of trust here, but, I mean, realistically, none, neither of them has any reason to betray each other. So they, they choose to trust each other and move on. And then they come to this camp. Uh, verse 16. Um, and when he had taken him down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and the land of Judah. So I just kind of imagine... The David and his 400 men and this one other guy, like they crest the top of a sand dune and it's getting close to evening. So they just see like this vast amount of lights and this huge camp and there's music going on and people are dancing and people are drunk out of their minds and they're just having a party. And then there's 400 guys who are battle hardened and really angry. It's not going to end good. Uh, verse uh, 17 to 20. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day. And a man, and not a man of them escaped, except for 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds and all the people, and people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. So they wipe him out from sunset to sunset the next day. And the one thing kind of makes me laugh the way that they say it, like David, David slaughtered them. There is not a man who lived. Oh yeah, there are 400, except for 400 guys. But 
<laughs> they wipe them all out and, and recover anything, or recover yeah, basically everything and everyone. And they wipe them out so, so much that we never see the Amalekites until like, I think it's about 300 years later with Hezekiah. But notice that who the credit, though, throughout this passage is given to. Right? David slaughtered them. David recovered everything. David brought it back. David captured, and it's David's spoil. Everything is credited to David, which is not a great look when you're supposed to be turning to the Lord and giving him credit, and everything's being credited to you. Verse 21. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David uh, when they had been left at the brook Besser. And they went out to meet David, or yeah, and they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he, and I would expect to be like, he reprimanded them, he shouted at them, he was angry at them because they were so lazy. But that's not what happens. It says he greeted them. Which is, yeah, which is, is crazy. Like these people were, were too weak to keep going to save their own family, which also would have been a really awkward conversation. Like, hey, these people saved us. Where were you? Like, I was tired. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have been a fun conversation. Um, but we'll read verse 22, or the rest of that. Yeah, we greeted them, verse 22. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with, uh, who had gone with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. So the 400 men want to give the 200 what they deserve, which is nothing. They say like, okay, we'll give them back their wives and their kids, but that's it. After that, you guys got to skedaddle. We're done. Which makes sense. Like if you had... Wives and kids is like the most motivation you're ever going to get when you're like going into battle. And these guys just gave up. So like next time you go to battle and things are a little tough, are you guys going to be the guys who just like peace out? It's like, oh, sorry, we can't do it. Like it would have been difficult to trust these guys after this. So let's get rid of the weak links. I mean, we're quite competent, the 400 of us. Like we just wiped out all these guys. So you guys, sorry, you're not cut from the same cloth as us, you can leave. You can't just mooch off of what we've done. And it's that exact attitude that gets them called wicked and worthless. Their logical reasoning for why we should kick these guys out is wicked and worthless. Verses 23 to 25. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us, he has preserved us and has given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from the day forward to this day. So David says, absolutely not. You can't. You can't do that with what God has given us. So like, remember just earlier when we said that every part of the battle was being credited to David. Apparently this hadn't gotten to David's head. He instead correctly realized that this is not a win because I was being clever or because we were well-trained men. This is, the only reason why we were able to capture all of this is because of God. We didn't earn this at all. It's completely God's doing. So if this is God's gift to us, his blessing to us, then how can we just hoard it to ourselves like somehow we earned this? We didn't. It was all him. So obviously we need to be generous with it and give it freely because we didn't, we didn't earn this at all. Right? Like, and so he makes it a rule from this day forward that even anyone who participates in the battle in any way possible gets to participate in the spoils of the battle because we aren't the ones who are winning this. It's God. And so even the people who stayed back and were too tired and who stayed with the baggage, they get just as much as we do. 
which is crazy. But generous, we're called to be generous with what God is doing. And his generosity doesn't just stop with the 200 men who weren't able to go on. Verses 26 to 31, the end. It says, When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth of the Negeb, of Jader, of Aroer, of Sifmoth, in Eshtemoa, in Rechel, in the cities of the Jeremelites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Horma, and Borashan, and Atak, in Hebron, and for all the places where David and his men had roamed. So he gets back to Ziklag and just says, like, He's so generous, and it's like, I don't just imagine Oprah, and you get some spoils, and you get some spoils, and like he's just giving everything to everyone, because this is not me. This is what God has blessed us with. And it also, it kind of shows of what he believes of God, too, right? Like, if I earn this thing, then I'm going to hold on to it, because I don't know when the next good thing is going to come. But if I trust that God has given this to me, and he's the father of blessings, then I don't need to hold on to it because I'm his child and I believe he will bless me again. So I don't need to hold on to this stuff because it's never going to come again. Like if I trust in the Lord and who he says he is, then I can be generous with this knowing that it's not going to run out. Um, And like, yeah, it's pretty cool to see how David is just generous with everyone. And it it also sets up what he's going to be like as king too. Where, like, we are going to be a people who are generous with what God has given to us, which is exactly what Israel was supposed to be as a nation, right? They were supposed to be, God was supposed to bless them, and the blessing was supposed to be obvious for all the nations to see so that they would come to know the Lord, too. And just what we're supposed to be, in, in a sense, as well, right? God has blessed us, and so we share that blessing with the nations around us, and they see the greatness of our God. Yet, how many of us, when we are blessed, hang on to that blessing for all we're worth because it's mine. I earned this. I worked really hard for this. Don't take it away. Whether it's an extra windfall of cash or a prize that you won or a, a vacation or a talent or a gift, it's so easy to hold on to good things that happen and then milk them for all this worth because I earned it. Because we believe I caused this to happen. And yet, Imagine if we all had the same attitude as David, the impact that we could make on the people around us. Uh, I saw an experiment a while ago where a guy went out and he met strangers on the street and said, I have 10 bucks and I have a coin. And I'll flip it and we'll play heads or tails. If I'm right, you give me 10 bucks. If you're right, I give you 10 bucks. And no one took him out on the offer. And so he said, okay, fine. What if I increased it? And he went all the way up to I'll give you $20 if you give me $10. And then some people took it, but there were still some people like, no. He's like, well, why? And they said, because I, they said, well, I guess I'm just valuing my hard-earned $10 more than your 20. And I think that often that's how we look at life sometimes, where sure, the reward might be great, but it's not worth me losing my hard-earned blessing. It's not worth me being generous because this losing this ten dollars would really hurt me. And again, and it's not just money too, right? Like, depending on what it is, I I risk losing money, time, pride, honor, status, and we work really hard for those things. And it's painful to lose things like that. But if we recognize that this ten dollars, this blessing, was never really mine to begin with, it's what God has given me, then we're free to give it away because we know it's not mine and God will give me more. I don't need to hold on to it. I need to be generous as possible. And none of this is possible, though, if David doesn't do what he did in verse 6, where he turns to the Lord and finds his strength in him. Unless we turn to the Lord and find our strength in him, we're not going to be able to be generous with the gifts that he's given us. And so I hope that we can embody the same attitude of David, where we turn to the Lord and we recognize that all this is from him and we bless everyone around him because of the generous God that we serve. Let's pray.
God, I thank you that you are so good, and I thank you for the example of David. It's, it's encouraging and also challenging to see the way that he's followed you, even though he's not perfect, to see he has the humility and wherewithal to turn to you and to find his strength uh, in you. And Lord, it's so easy for us to be caught up in our own world and to think that we are almighty when we are far from it. And so Lord, I, I pray that you would deal with us gently, but that you remind us that you are good and loving and yeah, that your ways are best. Help us to trust you. And, and I, I pray that we would see many come to know you because of our generosity with what you've given us. Thank you that you are good. Amen. Please stand with us uh, for our closing song. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him The Son of God was laid in darkness. The battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the storm was rolled his perfect love could not be overcome. And now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you Forever he is 
James 1, 16, 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, with whom there is no variation or no shadow due to change. And then, like we open the service, Isaiah 40, um, verses 28 and on. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases his strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like, with, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Have a wonderful week.